again. Hi, I'm Carlton Doe. Welcome to uh, this IIUG uh, co-sponsored event on the uh, 1410 XC4 webcasts. Um, uh, this is the third and final event. It is going to cover enhancements to Java as well as system administration. Uh, we do have um, the HCL developers who are responsible for these features uh, on the webcast. I believe they are monitoring the, um, the chat session. So as we go along, if you have a question, please feel free to drop it in there and um, uh, they may answer or they may wait until we, we open the phone lines for, uh, uh, for question and answer that way. Right now, all of your lines are, um, are muted. Um, so when I do open the lines, I would ask that you mute your own device so we don't get a lot of background noise. So um, again, I ask, can you guys hear me okay? I'm, I'm seeing one or two messages in the chat that says uh, you cannot hear my voice. Somebody could just chime in real quick and say yes or no. Okay, thanks, John. All right, so here we go. And we are going to start with... Um, we're going to start with uh, enhancements to system administration. There are five or six things here that I'll cover, including uh, semi-bufferless shared memory dumps, uh, enhancements to the data dictionary, sysadmin, really, really nice stuff done there, uh, uh, some changes and enhancements to on-check and on-stat, as well as uh, a change to uh, uh, time stamping inside the instance log. So let's go ahead and, and move forward with this. So as you guys know, when there is an instance assertion failure, you can decide what you want to do with the shared memory for that instance environment. You can, it, you know, some of the shared memory is dumped and you can parse it and do, you know, all sorts of investigation if you want. Uh, you can force a shared memory dump if you do an onstat minus lowercase o. Um, but the, the dump shared memory configuration parameter controls what happens to the shared memory dump. So if you set it to one, it dumps everything. Um, all the buffer pools, all the, um, the registers, I mean, the whole kit and caboodle. And so if you've got a 40 gig uh, uh, shared memory image on the instance, you're gonna get a 40 gig dump file. If you set it to two prior to XC4, it would dump the shared memory, but not the buffer pools, which gives you a clue as to what, uh, what is going to happen now in XC4. If you set it to five or six, um, again, it enables the feature, but the type and the size of the dumps that are created really depend on what has already been dumped for that session. You know, how much space is available to do the dump and so forth. All right, so what did we do in XC4? Well, setting the dump shared or bleh, setting dump shem to two becomes kind of bufferless. So the dump will include the active buffers, those that actually have read and write um, session information, but it won't dump the um, buffers which aren't being used. And I'm picking up somebody somebody's feedback here. Hold on just a second. Um, don't know why. That's coming through. Okay, anyway, um, the buffer information is at the end of the dump, and it kind of looks like what you get when you run an onstat minus B command. Um, and there is now a new flag to onstat. Hey, it wouldn't be a new version or fixed pack of Informix if there weren't new flags to onstat. And that is the aux flag, uh, and it's used in conjunction with the onstat minus G. And it gives you the ability to read these shared memory buffer dumps. So hold on just a second. Let me see where uh, this feedback is coming from. Uh, here, just a second. Okay. Everybody should be muted now. while I was at it. Okay, can you guys still hear me okay? Yes, okay, great. 
Um, so where were we? Okay, yes, the new on step minus G aux flag. Um, so here's what you get out of it. Um, you're going to have to pass it the, the shared memory dump file. And if you do just a non set minus G aux, it's going to print a summary of the active buffers. If you do, if you use the H buffs, it's going to print it in hexadecimal format. If you do the B buffs, it's going to give it to you in binary format. Now, don't try and run these commands um, if, you know, against a running instance. This is only going to work on a shared memory dump from a dead instance. You might ask me, how do I know? Haha, <laughs> I, I tried it, okay, and it doesn't work. So anyway, this is, this is what you will see when you run an on step minus G to a shared memory dump. And I did borrow this from uh, one of the, uh, the developers, so this isn't off of one of my systems. But anyway, that's the new shared memory uh, semi-bufferless uh, dump. Data dictionary enhancements. So if you do an on step minus D dictionary command, it gives you information about each table that is active in the instance, including the shared memory, or including the system tables. So here's a quick and dirty output um, from my test system. You can see um, I've got a couple of end user tables. There's a customer full and a customer empty. There's some sys columns in the, the memory system and, and so forth, other tables, okay? Now, if you run this command, for a specific table, you'll get different sections of information. So you'll, the first section gives you information on the SQL activity within the table. Second section will give you column-related information. What's the column name, the type, the length, and so forth. Um, the third section gives you information about indices. And this is just a partial output of, of what you would get on an index. And then finally, the fourth component of it gives you any referential integrity constraints and triggers which have been created on the table. Now prior to XC4, you would have to run this command individually for each table you wanted this output on. In XC4 now, there's a new flag, the zero flag, which will print out all information for all tables uh, within the instance. So you can now grab everything. In between each table, there will be this dashed line as, as a divider. So it's very easy, or at least it's easier to see where one table ends and another table begins. So again, it's a nice enhancement um, uh, to this functionality if you need to use it. Sysadmin, oh, there is some good stuff added here. So the sysadmin API and the sysadmin database uh, was added in the Informix version 11 timeframe. And I trust that everybody's familiar with it. You use it often and you love it like I do. One of the great features of the API is you can administer practically anything in the instance through an SQL command in conjunction with either the task or the admin functions. Unfortunately, those functions were not what I would call terribly user friendly. So you might have a command you want to run and you can't remember how many parameters do I need to put into this command. If you ran it and the parameter um, string wasn't correct, you'd get these really awful error messages back which didn't help you at all. In XC4 now, the API has been enhanced to provide syntax guidance and support for these two functions and the API in general. So we start with a new flag called usage. So you can do an execute function task or admin, put in usage, and you can see now the first set of parameters, syntax parameters, that the function would expect. Are you going to do an add, an alter, an archive? Are you going to import? Are you going to do an on mode command? Are you going to do something with a storage pool? If you continue on, and you say, okay, execute function task archive, it will now come back and say, I'm sorry, but you didn't provide all the arguments that I was expecting. Here is the list of what I would expect to see next. Now with archive, there's only one additional parameter, which is fake. So here's the full syntax for that particular command. If it is a multi-parameter command, for example, execute function task create, 
then it's kind of come back and say, well, do you want to create a blob space, a chunk, a DB space, DB access demo, blah, 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 blah. And so you can say, well, okay, execute function, create um, DB space. And then it's going to say, well, wait a second, do you want with check? Do you want encrypted? What's the name? What's the path? What's the size? So it's become very, very friendly now, or very, very more, much more friendly than it used to be. And it will help you or help new administrators if they're executing tasks that they haven't run in the past. So I think this is a really nice add-on and, and is something um, that I'm, I'm very glad to see. Okay, on check minus PE. So on check minus PE shows you how many pages of space are allocated for individual spaces and individual tables within those spaces. Now, in earlier versions of Informix, the, out, the output only included the offset and the allocated size for whatever that particular um, object was. In XC14, we're now including the part number for that allocation as well as what the extent number is for that object within the DB space. Excuse me. And these extent numbers are indexed from one. So here you can see now I've, I've done just a, a basic output on a DB space. You can see the, the offset and the size as we used to have. Now we've got the part number and we've got the extent number. So let's say I want to look at the sysproc body um, table within the IHQ repository database. And as I scan through this, I see, you know, in this particular example, you know, it's a certain size and it's extent number six, it would appear. If you want to gather all the information for that particular table, you can simply grep for it. So here's an on check minus PE, grep for sysproc body, and then grep for the database I'm interested in. And there's all the allocations with their part numbers for that particular object in the database. And you can track where they are, how big they are, and everything else. It's, it, it's a really nice thing to have. Um, and this is just an example of me looking for IHQ sensor functionality. So again, I was uh, uh, repping for objects within the IHQ repository database. And you can see all the different uh, tables that are created for the different sensors that I had active in the instance at that particular moment in time. Now, obviously, if your space has logical logs in them, you will get output for those as well. But since they are not partitioned, you are not going to get part numbers or extent numbers for them, just so you know. And that's on check minus PE. Uh, instance log date stamps. And this, I think, um, this was discussed in the uh, Informix community page a couple of weeks ago that I think there is some uh, functional enhancements to this to get it to work properly across all the instances, but, or all the instance types. But let me explain to you how it's, how it's supposed to work anyway. Prior to XC4, the default behavior in the, uh, in the instance log was, inc was to include the full date stamp at the beginning of the day or whenever the instance was turned on, and then for each event, just put the timestamp in. And it was just in uh, month, day, year format. Um, you could use the message date parameter to include um, the full date on each uh, message log entry if you wanted, but that was about as far as you could go. And it was the date format was always in what I would consider a US-centric format, again, of month, day, year. And it was a, um, in XC4 now, the message date parameter have been expanded, and they also take into account your database locale or your instance locale. So if, for example, you are outside of the US and use a day, month, year format, that will be represented within the, uh, within the date stamp. So uh, your message date uh, values now are zero, which is just the default timestamp only, one, which will give you a full uh, date stamp, 
or timestamp, month, day, year, hours, minutes, second, and it will be locale dependent. Two will give you milliseconds since the epoch plus date time, and again will be lo locale dependent. And then three will give you a standard informix date time to three places of precision within the second. However, this option is not locale dependent. So it will give it to you in the standard month, day, or at least the US standard month, day, year format. So this is what it looks like. If I change my, uh, my message date parameter to two, which gives me milliseconds, now you can see in, inside the message log, I get those seconds and the month, day, year, um, and timestamp value. If I set it to three for sub-second timestamp, again, I get those three places of precision um, after the second. And that is timestamp uh, enhancements within the message log. Finally, I think the last thing we're going to cover in here is onstat minus K or capital K enhancements. As you know, the onstat minus K displays lock information. And prior to XC14, it just told you what the lock was, who the owner was, and that was about as far as it went. You would have to take that lock address and somehow trace it to a user session. And then from that user session, you'd have to look at what the statement was. And it was a lot of jumping through hoops and a lot of hexadecimal parsing. In XC4 now, we're giving you the table name that the lock is on as well as, and I'll cover it more on the next slide, the DML operation, which is holding that lock. So here you can see just a broad uh, picture of, of, what, uh, of what the command looks like now. So uh, we now have this new DML column, and you can see what it looks like down below. And again, I borrowed this from, from JC in his presentation. But he had, um, in his active session, he had a number of, of uh, or excuse me, in his active instance, he had a number of sessions, some of which were doing inserts, some of which were doing deletes, some were doing updates. So it just gives you a lot more information and less hoops or fewer hoops you have to jump through to figure out who's doing what and what type of lock is being held. And that, I believe, is everything. Oh, wait, no, one more. This is a cool little feature. Um, you guys are all familiar with the top command inside of the operating system. The instance now has a top command within it, and it's via a new onstat flag. Again, it's not a new version of Informix without a new onstat flag. So onstat minus g top gives you a whole series of information on uh, session resources and, or instance resources and how they're being used. You can look at uh, different threads, different CPU and disk reads, buffer reads, physical log reads, disk reads, memory growth, all sorts of information. Okay? If you do an onstat minus G top, um, it's going to grab the uh, first 10 lines uh, for a five second interval of time. Now this is in my test system and I didn't have a whole lot of anything running. So there's, there's not a whole lot to display here. Um, so just, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have more, uh, a better display to, to give you. If, um, as I said, if you just do a top, it's, it's going to grab um, the first 10 entries over a five second time span, however, you can change what that time span is, as well as the number of um, reports for each section. So in this bottom section of, or the, this bottom illustration, I'm saying give me the top two entries over a 10 second window um, for, for all of the different sections. Now if I, just like in an, in an OS top command, if I want this to repeat, I can put in the number of repeats. So this command, the on, on set minus g top 133, it's going to give me one entry per section over a three second window, and it's going to repeat three times before the, uh, before the command stops. Or you can have it give, give you all of the entries over a two second window and just continue to run every two seconds 
until I interrupt you. That's what that zero flag does on the end. So um, you can look at a specific category with or without a time slice and with or without a number of entries. So for example, I said I just want to look at the average chunk write times. So I can do an onstep minus G top chunk AWT, or I can just look at disk reads, or I can look at uh, buffer reads over a 10 second time slice. And so you can use, you can mix and match and interchange all these different parameters uh, as you need to get the information you want out of the, uh, out of the session. And by default, the commands always run from maximum to minimum. So you're going to get the highest usage um, set of information first and then through, through the entries it will decrease. However, oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you want to look at CPU uh, utilization for a session, um, you can use this flag and it will, it will give you your, your top um, CPU user. Um, now then, as I, as I was about to say, um, top session CPU 5.5 will give you the five highest CPU usage sessions over a five second window. But if you capitalize the second parameter, so in this particular case, CPU is capitalized, you're now going to get ascending order. So in this particular case, I'm going to find my first five idle, dead, stopped, gone to, you know, gone to lunch type sessions. Um, so again, you have options on how you, how you get the output. And that is everything we have on system administration. So what I'm going to do now is uh, unmute the phones. If you have any questions, now would be the time to ask them. Um, if I would ask that you mute your own device so that we don't get a lot of background here. Let me turn this on. Why am I not, why am I not getting the button I need? Okay, there we go. Okay, so everybody is unmuted. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them at this time. No question? Okay. Well, I just muted everybody and we'll, we'll, we will continue on then. So the last section has to do with the wire listener and general Java enhancements. Um, so the wire listener uh, was introduced in 1210XC3. It is a Java application that uh, functions as the connectivity driver interface between NoSQL applications and the instance. So if it's a MongoDB app, if it's REST, if it's MQTT, those applications will connect to the wire listener and, uh, and then the wire listener forwards the connection um, after translating their their Mongo REST and MQTT commands to Squilly, uh, then passes those Squilly commands to the instance. The wire listener can use any network-based instance connection. So it can use DB server name if it's network-based. It can use any of the DB server aliases that are network-based. Best practice, however, is to define a specific DB server alias or several DB server aliases specifically for wire listener functionality. Gives you the ability to trace easier um, if something goes on. So in my particular case in this test environment, I have my instance name and then I have a specific DB server alias for the wire listener. They're both net, they're both socket based, they're both network based. And because they're both network based, they can share the same net type parameter um, in the uh, in the on config file as far as um, you know sql host there's nothing special you need to configure um, to to get the wire listener up and running you you just define the db server alias as you always did so in this particular case you can see my mon inst1 socket based i'm using local loopback and we'll talk about that in just a second and what the port number is 
and Etsy services, you can see that there is a port number assigned for this wire listener, and it's 60001. Now, historically speaking, and I probably should have verified this before I got on the phone today, if the application was co-resident on the same server as the instance, the wire listener was more stable and gave you greater throughput if you used a local loopback connection for it than if you used a resolvable host name or, or an explicit host name. Um, like I said, I haven't tested this recently to see if there's any change in, in uh, functionality, but at least that was the general guideline and, and recommendation that was made. So that's why you see the 127 configuration here uh, for the wire listener. Now, the wire listener itself has a properties file, since it's a Java application, much like the properties file for IHQ. And there's two important pieces of information within that properties file. The, the bottom part, or the, the, the section at the bottom, is the listener port number. What port number, and this represents the port number that the wire listener will use to listen for connections from the NoSQL applications. So in this particular case, um, I'm configuring this for a default Mongo application, so it's listening on 27017. Then there is the outbound connection, and this is where you define how the wire listener is going to connect to the instance. So again, because this is all co-resonant on, on uh, my same machine, I'm just using localhost. But notice I'm using the port number that is assigned to that um, that instance alias, I list which instance I want to connect to, and then there is a user ID and a password because you, you know, this the wire listener has to connect to the instance. Now, in earlier versions of Informix, prior to, well, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. So this is what the connection path actually looks like. So on the top, again, you can see I've got my SQL host information, I've got my Etsy services information, and what happens is the NoSQL app will be talking on port 27017, and it will connect to the wire listener, which is listening on that port number. The wire listener will do its magic, convert the MQTT or the REST or the Mongo API commands into Squilly, and will output it to the instance on, in this case, port 60001, which is the alias that I have set up for NoSQL applications. Conversely, once the instance has um, the data it needs to send back, it will go out on port 60001 to the listener, which will translate it back to 27017 and send it to the app. So that's how the, the wire listener actually facilitates and manages the connection and, and data throughput between these applications and the instance. Now, in earlier versions of Informix, if you installed the instance using typical mode, the IFX JSON user ID was automatically created for you. It was made part of the DBSA group so that the wire listener can execute administrative commands if that came through the listener. It was also automatically given replication privileges inside of the instance so it could execute sharding and other ER-related operations. In 14, that is no longer the case. So the IFX JSON user ID is, is no longer there or is no longer created by us. But inside of that Java URL command, you do have an ID and you do have a password, and that is in clear text. So you're going to have to create some sort of a user ID for this. Whether it's IFX JSON or it's some other user ID doesn't really matter to us. But what we strongly encourage you to do is make that particular user ID a no login ID. And by that I mean when you create the ID, and in this case I'm using IFX JSON, do not give it a valid shell inside of the operating system. Set it to dev null or you know, bin no login or something, or in this case just leave it blank, so that if, if somebody gets a hold of those credentials out of the properties file and tries to log into your machine, they can't get in. Yeah, they can connect to the instance, but they're not going to be able to log into the machine. So you'll have to create the ID, 
then using the sysadmin API, you're going to have to grant the replication privilege to that non-Informix user ID, and that's, uh, that's functionality we gave you in version 12.10, the ability to grant a specific uh, level of um, instance privileges to user IDs. And then, of course, you're going to need to add that user ID to the Informix group as a secondary group, so it's part of the um, um, DBSA group. But anyway, so that's the background. So what did we do in NEXT 4 Well, we've upgraded the, the level of API support. The wire listener now supports MongoDB uh, API versions 3.2 all the way through the most current 4.2. Prior to XC4, the only versions that we, were, we supported, at least as far as Mongo is concerned, were uh, very old, to be kind and they were all out of support years ago. So now you, have, now you can choose any, any API level you want all the way up to the current level, which is 4.2. Now, we don't support every single feature in uh, API version 4.2. We support the most commonly used ones, and if you do try and use a function, a function that is not supported, you will get a user-friendly error message out of the API. We're just not going to give you a hexadecimal code and, and leave you swinging in the breeze. Um, so we'll give you a, a, a nice error message that says it's not there yet. And I assume over time we will add other functionality um, to the API. Um, but you have a choice. Another, uh, another portion of the um, wired listener configuration file or properties file is which version of the Mongo API do you want to use. For backwards compatibility, the default is 2.4, but you can obviously alter this and change it to whatever you need for your applications. So that's enhancements to the wire listener, or at least the first part. The second part is changes to how the wire listener handles session authentication if you're using the REST or MQTT um, functionality. Prior to XC4, your only option was either to use password authentication modules or the Java URL connection. And neither of these methods worked really well for REST or MQTT sessions. And developers using REST or MQTT had to figure out how to make uh, PAM work or how to use the, the Java uh, connections and, and manage the, the Java URLs. In XC4, you can still use the MongoDB style or the PAM module, or we're now giving you the ability to use just a regular defined Informix user ID, just like a Squilly app. This can be a regular OS ID or it can be a mapped ID. So if you want to reuse another ID that exists within your instance environment and map it to one, you can go ahead and do that. So now this makes it just as easy for REST or MQTT applications to connect to the instance as a Squilly application. So the REST and MQTT applications will still communicate through the wire listener, and the wire listener is just going to pass the user ID and the password and that, that particular connection will appear to the instance as if it's just a regular JDBC connection and not coming through the wire listener. Okay. So I think that's all we have on that. Oh, wait. I think I'd remember my own presentation. Um, next up is uh, performance enhancements for REST-based operation. Uh, and some of these performance enhancements come just from the fact that we've implemented JDBC version 450 uh, within, um, within our environment. Um, so we're generally finding about 25% better performance for queries and other operations if you're using REST. But um, it will depend on what it is you're doing and how you've configured the wire listener. We've also changed and, and given you, um, well, let me back up. The listener.type parameter determines whether this wire listener session is either going to be a Mongo API, a REST, or an MQTT uh, interface. 
when you select either REST or MQTT, it's going to automatically modify the response.documents.size.maximum parameter for you. Well, why is that important? Well, for Mongo API sessions, the API itself has a fixed hard-coded limit of about one megabyte for data that gets passed back and forth. The REST API does not have that limit. So if you set the listener type to REST, that document size parameter will be reset to unlimited so that all the information for a particular query can be set back in a single package rather than having to split it up into one, one megabyte chunks. So that's part of what uh, contributes to uh, the speed in the new um, wire listener. Now obviously if you want to impose your own limit on this, you can. I'm just saying that's what the default uh, behavior is. In terms of general JDBC enhancements, I will have to admit we're now getting into an area that I am not terribly comfortable. So if you have any questions on this, please put them in the chat or when I un unmute the phones, I'm sure Brian, uh, who's on the line, would be glad to answer that or answer them. In, in XC4, we have introduced type maps and global type maps. And as I understand it, a type map is how a user-defined type in Informix is mapped to Java classes within the application. So for example, in Informix, we have a BSON data type, and it's a binary type within the instance. Well, in JDBC, there's a BSON class, which supports sending and receiving this binary data to and from this data type, and that's what the application uses. Now, prior to XC4, there were two hard-coded type maps in the JDBC driver. And if you wanted to use any other type, you had to define your own type map for those particular data, data types. In XC4, we're now giving you, um, um, well, let me step back just a second. Um, so while we gave you the ability to, to define your own type maps, if the session was anything other than a persistent connection, so if your application connected, you could define the type and everything worked well. But if you were using connection pools, or if your application was written such that it would connect to the instance, get some data, disconnect, do some work, reconnect again, do some work, disconnect, do some more work, we had problems managing those type maps and, and getting everything to line up correctly. Well, in JDBC 4.5, we're now giving you a global type map building infrastructure that supports all of the supported Informix UDTs, not just the two that we had previously. Now, again, you can still add your own types, and you can register these within the global type map functionality. So when your, when your, new, when your JDBC connection uh, is established, you can go out and call the global builder and just go ahead and assign those user-defined types to your application classes, and you're ready to go. Um, what else did we do? Um, oops, I went the wrong way. Okay. Um, the JDBC driver itself comes with four bundled um, UDTs, two of which are now new. So we have the JSON and BSON, and the, the JSON one is, in, is implemented as a wrapper. We now have the binary var and the binary 18 types within the driver. Okay, so there's that portion. Um, the driver itself saw some performance enhancements. Um, the, the entire JDBC functionality has seen quite a bit of work. Brian has done an immense amount of work in this area. And so some of the enhancements that um, benefit the JDBC driver also enhance other areas of the instance that use Java, including IHQ. So column lookups are faster. Uh, instantiating of BSON objects is faster. Encoding to and from BSON and, and JSON is now faster. Uh, connecting a JDBC session is faster. Inserts and, and using prepared statements are all faster. So again, just some nice work some nice side benefits um, that Brian has put into the instance. 
Finally, the last piece of JDBC functionality are some new connection parameters. And these are compatibility parameters so that if your application, if you're migrating an application from another database to Informix, um, you, you can have the same type of functionality. So is the metadata in uppercase? Um, do we case the schema commands? If you're using mode ANSI databases, will the cursor be held open over a commit? Um, and other things that are in there. And finally, some J Foundation enhancements inside the instance. Um, J Foundation didn't see as many enhancements as the client driver, but nonetheless, there are some very, very good things in here. Um, the first one I want to talk about is a new function which gives you the ability to list what J Foundation functions are available to use. So, for example, I can go out and create this little function that says, get me all the functions, and then I can run it. And I can look and see, okay, there's this function and that function and this function and that function, da 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 as well as if you want to look at the grant and the drop commands for these functions, you can, you can grab it as well. So if you have an application that's working fine on one instance but is not working fine on the other, and you think it has to do with some um, uh, user-defined routines that are missing, you can now go and look for those Java-based uh, routines in one instance and see if they exist in the other, and then if they don't, do what work you need to do. Um, we also now give you the ability to do a set explain on uh, in J Foundation and be able to output that information to the session that calls it. So as you know, if you typically turn set explain on, it creates an output file on the uh, on the system that's hosting the instance. Now what will happen is um, you can use the get explain command and it will generate the explain file like always on the, the host um, hosting the instance, but then that query plan will be sent back to the calling application as an LVAR char and you can parse it and so forth and do whatever, um, do whatever work you need to do and the file is deleted on the, uh, on the server side. So this is just an example of, of it being used. And there's some new utilities for large objects within, um, uh, within J Foundation. Um, so these objects give you, or these options or functions give you the ability to return the size of a large object give you the ability to concatenate strings into a character large object to create a new character large object which either can be used um, inside the application or can be stored within the instance. Uh, you can dump a clob and you can create a clob from any string. And these are the, the functions themselves, what they, what they look like and what they expect to see. And this is how they work. So I created a little test table with two columns um, and a clob, and I inserted some data into it. So I've got hello world and hello moon. And so I want to see, well, how big are these are the clobs inside my database? So I can do a lob size and see that one is um, 12 characters and the other is 11. I can run a concatenation command on one of these clobs and add more text to it. Now all this did was change the, uh, change the large object itself. It did not save it into the database. So if you want to run a select statement, grab, you know, manipulate the clob and then pass it back to the application, this is how you would use it. If you want to actually store this newly, um, newly created string, you use the append command. So again, I grab the original clob, I put a lot more text onto it, save it in the, in, the, uh, in the table, and you know now it's been appended and updated inside the database. And so this, these functions give you the ability to do some quick and dirty testing with clobs and blobs without having to be a Java programmer or recompiling an application or you know things along those lines. So again, nice functionality to have. 
Finally, the last thing has to do with a change data capture Java transaction engine. So for a, for a period of time, the IBM change data capture product did not support Informix. Um, they have now changed that in the latest version of their products. They are now supporting Informix. Um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a big fan of, of change data capture, but hey, it's an IBM product, so rah, rah, rah go. Um, but one of the interesting aspects of change data capture is it gathers everything, including junk you really don't want. So I don't really need the begin work message. I don't need the commit work. I don't need rollbacks and timeouts and so forth. What you really want out of change data capture is what committed data changed. Well, in, in the default CDC engine, um, you're going to get all of that information. Now, you can work around that one of two ways. Uh, I think we have better technology in the engine with smart triggers and asynchronous post-commit triggers because, again, they just give you the, the committed data without any of the extra what I would call garbage. However, if you are in a situation where you have to use CDC, we have now built a transaction engine inside of the instance for CDC application, and it only provides the committed data. And you can specify which type of commits you want to see. Do you want to see just inserts and updates or deletes? Do you want to include timeout messages or not? You have that option. Um, but it will, like I said, it will just give you the information you really need as opposed to all the other extraneous stuff. And that, I believe, is everything that I have to cover today. So what I'm going to do now is unlock uh, audio here, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. If not, thank you for attending. As I said, the replay will be available later on today. So everybody is, is unmuted. If you don't have a question, please mute your device. Um, are there any questions you'd like to ask? Going once, going twice, okay, well thank you for, thank you for coming, um, and with that I will go ahead and uh, end the session. Um, I hope this has been of value to you, and uh, we will um, talk with you soon, bye.